Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Today, uh, we are taking a really rapid, high-stakes look at the heart's electrical system. Now, the plumbing, the wiring, and specifically, how tiny delays in that wiring, I mean, really small timing issues, mm -hmm. can be the difference between, say, a normal finding in an athlete and a genuine medical emergency needing urgent intervention. The whole electrical pathway in the heart, it's intricate, right? But the main point, what we're focusing on today, is how these delays, these conduction blocks, signal trouble. Wait, right, let's unpack this. We're diving into cardiac conduction blocks, uh, specifically atrioventricular or AV blocks, the bundle branch blocks, you know, RBBB and LBBB, mm -hmm. huh. and figuring out what makes one block just something to watch versus one that needs, well, immediate action. Right. And our mission here is really about clinical usefulness. We've looked at sources with clear ECG criteria, management guides, the works. We want to give you a solid framework so you can spot the pattern quickly, know the difference between benign and uh, pathological rhythms, and crucially, know exactly when a pacemaker is absolutely necessary. Okay, so let's start where the signal passes that first main gate, the AV node. AV block means there's some kind of impaired conduction getting from the atria down into the ventricles. And we classify them, right? Based on how much it gets through. Exactly. It's all about how many signals make it and how consistently. So let's start with the mildest one, first degree AV block. Yeah, first degree block. People often call it the benign delay and well, usually for good reason. The signal slows down going through the AV node, but, and this is key, every single beat still gets through. No dropped beats. On the ECG, it's pretty straightforward. The PR interval is consistently long, so greater than 0 0.20 seconds uh, or five small squares. And importantly, every P wave does have a QRS following it. Yeah. You see this quite a bit, actually, like in athletes with high vagal tone or maybe due to medications like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers sometimes. Okay, hold on. You said benign delay, but we're still talking about it. Why bother if it's usually not a problem? Does it ever matter? That's a really fair point because in isolation, you're right, it usually doesn't cause issues. But um, a couple of things. If that PR gets really long, say over 0.3 seconds, it can actually affect how the ventricles feel, potentially causing symptoms like dizziness. And maybe more importantly, it tells us something about the baseline state of the conduction system. If someone with a known first-degree block suddenly develops more block, well, you know their system was already a bit stressed. Ah, uh, okay. So it's context. It's a baseline marker. Makes sense. Now, things start getting, well, really interesting, and the stakes definitely go up with second-degree AV blocks. This is where beats actually start getting dropped, right? Precisely. And there are two very different types here with very different implications. Let's tackle Mobitz type I first, often called Venkabach. The block here is typically high up, actually within the AV node itself. Ah, Venkabach. That's the one with the mnemonic, isn't it? Longer, longer, longer drop. Then you have a Venkabach. That's the one. You see the PR interval getting progressively longer with each beat. The node is tiring, essentially. Until finally, a P wave occurs that just doesn't get conducted. A QRS is dropped. Then the cycle resets. Yeah, that progressive lengthening is the absolute key feature. It's like watching someone get slower and slower until they just have to pause. And like first degree, this one is often benign, can be transient. High vagal tone again, or sometimes an inferior MI, which can affect the AV node's blood supply. Okay, so Venkabach, usually okay, but then there's Mobitz type 2. You mentioned the prognosis is totally different. Why? What's happening differently if the PR interval doesn't lengthen? It tells us the problem isn't usually in the AV node itself. The block is almost always below the AV node, down in the, his Purkinje system. That's the main wiring deep in the ventricles. And damage there, it's typically structural. Think fibrosis, maybe damage from a big anterior heart attack. It's not just fatigue like Venkabach. So on the ECG, how does that look? The PR interval stays constant. It might be normal, it might be prolonged, but it's the same beat after beat. Then suddenly, without any warning, a P wave appears and there's just no QRS after it. A beat is dropped out of the blue. Wow. So it's not a gradual slowing. It's like a wire suddenly breaking. Exactly. It's a much more unstable situation. That's why Mobitz type 2 is always considered pathological. There's a very high risk it could suddenly worsen and become a complete heart block. And this is a key takeaway, right? For anyone listening. Absolutely. This is critical. Mobitz type 2 means serious underlying disease. It requires a permanent pacemaker, period. Even if the patient feels perfectly fine when you identify it. Okay, that's a clear line in the sand, which logically leads us to the most severe block, third degree or complete AV block, the real emergency. Ah. Yeah, complete heart block. Here, the communication link is totally severed. No impulses from the atria make it down to the ventricles at all. So the atria are beating away, 
driven by the SA node usually. And the ventricles are beating too, but they're driven by some lower, slower escape pacemaker. They're completely independent. We call that AV dissociation. And the ECG must look pretty dramatic. It really does. You see regular P waves marching along at one rate and regular QRS complexes marching along at a much slower rate, but there's absolutely no relationship between them. The PR interval is totally variable, completely random. The atrial rate is always faster than the ventricular escape rate. And clinically, this sounds bad. It is. It's a true medical emergency. The slow ventricular rate often causes severe bradycardia, low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting spells. Those are the classic Stokes Adams attacks. That escape rhythm, whether it looks narrow or wide, just isn't reliable. So management is immediate. Immediate. Urgent, temporary pacing to stabilize the patient, followed quickly by implanting a permanent pacemaker. No question. Okay, we've covered the delays happening sort of uh, on the main highway down from the atria. Now let's shift focus to blocks happening within the branches, supplying the ventricles themselves, the bundle branch blocks. And the, the big sign here is a wide QRS, right? Wider than 120 milliseconds. Exactly. A wide QRS tells you ventricular depolarization is taking longer than usual, which suggests a block in one of the bundles. Let's start with right bundle branch block, RBBB. Here, the right bundle is blocked, so the left ventricle gets the signal normally and starts contracting, but the right ventricle has to be activated slowly, kind of cell by cell from the left side. That delay creates the specific RBBB pattern. And there's a mnemonic for this too, the rabbit ears. That's the classic one, yeah. Right bundle gives you rabbit ears, that typical RSRs pattern in the V1 lead on yeah. the ECG. You also often see a wide slurred S wave over in the lateral leads like V6. Now, you hear RBBB can be benign, especially in younger folks. That's true. Isolated RBBB found, incidentally, is often just a normal variant, nothing to worry about. But, there's always a but, isn't there? When should RBBB make us sit up and pay attention? What's the big red flag? The major red flag is seeing a new RBBB pop up in someone who has symptoms like acute chest pain or sudden shortness of breath. Okay, why? Because that combination strongly suggests acute strain on the right side of the heart. The most common and most dangerous cause of that is a massive pulmonary embolism, a PE. The PE blocks blood flow through the lungs, causing the right ventricle to suddenly struggle and dilate, which can stretch and block the right bundle. So the rule is, new RBBB plus concerning symptoms, you have to rule out PE urgently. Don't just call it benign until you've excluded that. Got it critical point. Now let's flip to the other side. Left bundle branch block LBBB. The mnemonic here is William. Yep, William. You tend to see a wide, predominantly negative QRS, sometimes looking like a WS in V1, and a broad, often notched M-shaped R wave in V6. And unlike RBBB, LBBB is generally taken much more seriously. Why is that? Because LBBB is almost always pathological. It signifies underlying structural heart disease. Think significant left ventricular hypertrophy, maybe from years of high blood pressure or coronary artery disease or cardiomyopathy. It's rarely just a normal finding. Okay, and here's the really crucial part, the thing that changes everything in, in an urgency setting. LBBB messes up our ability to diagnose a heart attack on the ECG. Absolutely. This is probably the single most important clinical implication of LBBBB. It fundamentally distorts the QRS complex and the subsequent ST segments and T waves. Can you break down why it masks an MI? Sure. Think of a st standard MI, like a STEMI. You get ST elevation because a specific area of heart muscle is injured and electrically unstable. That creates a localized electrical signal. Now, LBBB causes a global massive change in how the entire left ventricle depolarizes. It's slow, abnormal conduction everywhere. This creates huge electrical noise across the whole QRS and ST segment. So the LBBB means just drowns out the smaller MI signal. Precisely. The large, bizarre QRS and ST changes caused by the LBBB itself completely overwhelm or mask the more subtle ST elevation you'd normally see with an acute MI. We just can't reliably see it using the standard rules. Which leads to that critical rule. Which leads to the critical rule. If a patient presents with symptoms suggestive of an acute MI, like chest pain, and they have a new LBBB on their ECG or an old one where you can't be sure if it's new or not, you must treat it as if it is an acute MI. MI. It's considered a STEMI equivalent. Activate the cath lab. You can't afford to wait. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground from benign delays to STEMI equivalents. Let's try to synthesize this. When we're looking at these blocks, especially the AV blocks, what's the practical decision point? Observe or intervene with a pacemaker. Right, let's boil it down for the AV blocks. First degree AV block and Mogut's type I, the Venkabach type. 
generally you observe. You only really intervene with pacing if the slow heart rate is causing significant symptoms, severe dizziness, fainting, that kind of thing. But then the line is drawn. Then the line is drawn very clearly. Mobitz type 2 and third degree complete AV block. These require a permanent pacemaker. Mandatory. Even if the patient says they feel okay. Even, even if they are asymptomatic when you find it. These blocks indicate disease low down in the conduction system, that Hisperkinja area. It's inherently unstable and unreliable. The risk of sudden, complete cardiac standstill is too high. So Mobitz the second, third degree, they get a pacemaker. Always. Okay, very clear. Now, you mentioned saving the scariest pattern for last. Let's talk about that rare, but... Uh frankly terrifying situation, alternating bundle branch block. Ah, yes, alternating BBB. This is when the ECG literally flips back and forth between showing an RBBB pattern on one beat and an LBBB pattern on the next, or over successive beats. Wow, so the block is jumping from side to side. What does that signify? It signifies profound widespread disease throughout the entire Hisperkinje system. Both bundles are severely affected. It's basically showing you that the final common pathway for ventricular activation is critically unstable and failing. So the implication is? The implication is impending complete heart block. It's not a matter of if the patient will progress to third degree block, but when. It could be minutes or hours. And the management? Non-negotiable and urgent. Permanent pacemaker. It's a class I indication. Top priority. The mnemonic is simple and absolute. Alternating BBB always needs a pacemaker, period. Before we wrap up, there's one other block we should touch on briefly just to differentiate it because it can cause pauses to sinoatrial or SA block. Slightly different mechanism. Right, slightly different location. SA block happens right at the source. The problem is between the SA node, the heart's natural pacemaker, and the surrounding atrial tissue. The SA node fires okay, but the signal just can't get out properly to start the heartbeat. Okay, and the key thing for recognizing this on an ECG compared to, say, just sinus arrest, where the SA node itself fails to fire. The aha moment, the key differentiator, is the timing of the pause. With SA block, you see a pause where an entire PQRST complex is just missing, but critically, the length of that pause will be an exact multiple of the patient's normal underlying PP interval. Exact multiple. So if their normal beat interval is, say, one second, the pause would be exactly two seconds. Or three seconds. Exactly. That precise mathematical relationship tells you the underlying pacemaker, the SA node, is still ticking away regularly in the background, but some of its exit signals are getting blocked. Sinus arrest, on the other hand, tends to cause pauses that aren't exact multiples. And management for SA block. Pacemaker again, but only if it's causing symptoms, dizziness, syncope due to the pauses. It's often part of what we call sick sinus syndrome. Hashtag tag outro. Wow, okay, that was a really dense but incredibly important tour through cardiac conduction blocks. We really hammered home those key distinctions, didn't we? I think so. The core idea is location, location, location. A simple delay high up in the AV node, like first degree or Fankbach, is usually okay. But blocks lower down, like Mobitz the second or third degree, reflecting structural damage in the Hisperkinja system, those demand respect and usually a pacemaker. And that sharp contrast between the bundle branch blocks too, RBBB, often benign, maybe think PE if it's new and acute. But LBBB almost always signifies underlying disease. And critically, you have to treat it like a STEMI if there's chest pain, because it hides the evidence. Absolutely. Understanding these electrical signals is just fundamental. It dictates immediate management. So let's leave our listeners with something to chew on. We talked a lot about how LBBB masks MI signs, forcing clinicians to rely on special criteria like the Scarbasa criteria, to try and see through the distortion. Think about this. How amazing is it that we developed ways to essentially decode a hidden heart attack from an ECG that looks completely scrambled by the LBBB? It shows just how deeply intertwined the heart structure is electrical timing and the resulting surface ECG really are. That complex interplay reading between the lines of the EKG, that's where the real art and science of interpretation lies, isn't it?